I was like, yeah, that's you. That is you. And I was like, okay. This is like the beginning of the, the chat. And I was like, oh uh-huh, yeah, that, that's me. And I'm here as well. And, and um, he's like, I want you in my films. That's what I do. When I like people, I put them up there and I'm like, I'm just going to put you in at some point. You've been up there for ages. And I was like, wow, I felt very honored. And we had this like lovely chat and he kind of told me what he's feeling. And, and, you know, he kind of asked like, you know, if I could learn Russian, I was like, sure, fine. Yes. <laughs> like all actors. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll do anything. Go. And, um, and we finished this, I don't know, meeting, audition. I don't know what it was. And I kind of rang my agent afterwards. I was like, I, I don't know what that, do, do I have a job? I don't know. Anyway, I kind of <laughs> carried on back with my life and then cut to a few you know, months later. And, and it felt like, I think in his head, it was a done deal. But it was, you know, they kind of waited a little bit. And then I got a call and they're like, yeah, well, you're going. And I'm so lucky because I don't have a British passport that I've got a Spanish passport because at the time it was, you know, June 2021, that, that you know, the kind of pandemic was in its full, you know, chaos. And at the time I couldn't, you know, if I hadn't had a, a Spanish passport, I wouldn't have been able to do it because they weren't letting anyone in from England. But oh, luckily wow. my agent was like, oh, you've got a Spanish passport, it's going to be okay, you have, but you have to go to Madrid for 10 days. And I was like, that's great. I've got my family there. And then I went straight from, from there to Berlin. It was a kind of wild journey with him. He's, he's a, such a lovely man. Amazing. And, and how, much, how much did he tell you about your character, Katia? And what can you tell us? I know, like, like I said, I haven't seen this movie yet, so spoiler free, but it sounds like she is um, someone who was involved in John Wick's past and this is where I don't want to enter spoiler territory, but he may have been responsible for her dad's death. No, the, um, well, you, you kind of don't go too much into that. There is actually someone else that kind of is more responsible for her dad's death. But he kind of made it out to me that I was basically, I'm either his, I'm basically his cousin. You know, I feel like there's, I, I'm definitely family. Hmm. And I'm the kind of now head of, the, well, the matriarch of uh, the Berlin side of um, the underworld of that family if that makes sense yeah okay okay and and how much how do you how do you research a character like that and how much is a collaboration with both yourself and the writer and chad so he he kind of spoke to me a lot about her intensity and her kind of you know she's she's basically had to come up to this role because her dad is dead and so that's quite you know as a woman in that world it's, it's quite a You've got to be a certain kind of woman to kind of write. My dad's dead. I'm now going to take over and I've got to be respected as a woman in this in this universe. So she's got a lot of strength and she's got her own sense of moral code, essentially, um, which is you know very brutal. But it works for her in her, uh-huh. in her universe. <laughs> and and he told me, you know, the, the Russian thing really helped me because it depends. Every character you, I get, you kind of get into them through a certain avenue and this one particularly was the language it's like she is this russian hardcore bitch and um from the roma family and that really helped find her and then once i got to berlin getting the costume um paco's amazing the guy that did it and he had all these different versions of it and chad sat throughout the whole fitting he like which is very rare for a director to actually just take a moment from his busy life and be like, I'm going to be here for the next few hours. And it was, the, we were the start of the movie. So I was there for the first two weeks of filming. And he I felt like he kind of, right, I want to get this first bit, you know, really going. And he sat there and we, we kind of found her all together because there were so many costume options. And then I find that sometimes once you get the costume on and the the makeup on, you really get a sense of a person. It's so much, so much of the work is done by the amazing kind of film team, if that makes sense. Because I think a lot in, in, in this series, particularly, I think a, a, a lot of the iconic nature of the characters is down to these spectacular costumes yeah. that they have. They're yeah. easily identifiable by whatever they have decided they should wear. Yeah, 100 percent. And and mine, I loved my outfit so much. I wanted to keep every single bit. Of it. <laughs> I did get to keep the, the necklace. They gave me like a little keep safe, which is rare in big films and big franchises. They tend to not let you have anything and um, I got to keep that and a cool bra. So, you know. Okay. That, that's something. That's something. Because everything else has to go. They have to go in the glass cases in Planet Hollywood. Mm-hmm. That's where they've got to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you didn't get to keep it. It's, it's, is it a leather waistcoat you wear? Is it some uh, a, some sort of leather? Yeah, it's kind of snake skin. Right. 
waistcoat and this ridiculous shirt and just I loved her earrings like all of it, it the tight tight leather trousers her boots I, I felt great I felt like I <laughs> I don't know I felt like I could easily play a gig in that outfit <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean uh, I'd, I'd argue that as an as a, as a franchise the the John Wick series is delivering the best action that we could hope to see. A hundred percent. I think it's. If, I think Chad and the team and everyone revolutionised uh, action movies. I mean, mm. even just the first one, you're like, wow, and and it just keeps getting better and better. And this last one is just, it's just three hours of just getting punched in the adrenal gland repeatedly. And just, I've watched it twice now because the first time actually I was very overwhelmed, um, and also because I'm in it and it's like, ah. Well, like, <laughs> the second time I actually got to watch it, the London premiere last week and i really took in the, the scope and the level of of it it's it's a it's an art piece it's a martial art art piece basically yeah yeah and i mean i saw i saw the photos there from the premiere john wick um keanu reeves walking uh the red carpet i mean as an actor i can't think of many people that there is such a a feel-good atmosphere around like people genuinely have a lot of love for him as a, an actor and the commitment i guess he puts in mm -hmm. to these films and, and the action what was it like working with him sharing those scenes with him oh he was lovely very very sweet and as, again chad he welcomed me on set on the first day and was just like we're gonna have a read through and i was like oh that's great um i was imagining like a big room and it was like no just me keanu reeves and him and the writer and i was like what and they really that's what i mean they really gave me time and 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 you know dedication to, to this to, to us building a little kind of nuclear unit before we started filming and he was lovely he was such a sweetheart okay uh there I, i'm currently trying to grow uh grow a beard uh like keanu reeves it's not going uh, particularly well because i think <laughs> i think the reason it looks good on keanu reeves is because as well as having the beard he's also keanu reeves uh which yeah, is exactly uh, i think yeah my stumbling it's not block. a bonus, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so this next question is purely for me. As a dog owner, um, I, I've got oh. a whippet, and uh, he does he does literally no stunts. Uh, he does very little, but specifically <laughs> not stunts. Um, did you meet the stunt oh, yeah, dogs? Got, uh, well, I've got what? my little own stunt dog right here. Oh, my God. Who's she, that? She's also – that's Mimosa. She's also my accountant. She does everything, really. I mean, she's great. <laughs> uh, um, I did get to meet the stun dog. So again, on the when I got there on set on that first day and I had that read through, Chad also took the time out of his busy life to show me. I basically felt like I was the new leading lady. Like that's how he treated <laughs> me. It was amazing. He literally showed me everything, showed me where the stunts were. I met all the dogs and the dog, you know what? They, they're amazing, but they are a little bit scary. Like I loved, I'm a big, but it's, whew, there was one and it's like, you know, obviously you got frisky because I was a new person. I was playing with them. They're like, yeah, you've got to be a bit calm because they're like stunt dogs. And <laughs> I think from what Chad told me, basically, when when they kind of brought in these dogs, I think it's the third one. Um, they had to ensure that the trainers who trained them would also keep the dogs because the, the amount of training it takes to train those dogs, that's a lot of money. But also those dogs, I think maybe it's a bit like millage dogs. They can't just be handed back or rescued or taken, you know, taken they've got to be looked after by someone that knows what they're doing for the rest of their lives. Mm. Um, and for example, on set, we weren't, <laughs> they had this sign everywhere going, no one can wear neon green. <laughs> because they're trained to attack neon green. And I remember my, my hair lady, Tony, she, she was British. She's like, fuck, all my shoes are green. So she had to go and buy new trainers <laughs> when we were there because if the dog's around, it will just see green. Just go for it. <laughs> of course. Of course. Because they can put an actor who needs to be attacked by the dog in the neon green, and then they can CGI it out. Yeah, but and they put but they put neon green in specific bits. So especially on the crotch, there's a lot of crotch <laughs> attack <laughs> in a lot of the films, and they you know they'll just have a little green piece of green there when they're when they're you know kind of rehearsing the stunts. So it's very important to not wear green. <laughs> It's good to know. That's, I'm glad I didn't visit the set in, in my favourite neon green suit because that would have <laughs> yeah. been a disaster. Um, what's it like becoming part of a, a, a massive franchise? I mean, it sounds like a dream and the, the way you were welcomed onto set, but it's also, I mean, to me, it would be quite daunting. It's, it's you know, it's the fourth instalment of this beloved franchise. But after being in massive productions like Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, The Mandalorian, is it just a regular day at the office for you? Uh, I think, <laughs> no, it's never a regular day in the office. <laughs> um, I think what was good about this is I didn't, 
I think if the role had been a bit bigger or if I'd had to do a lot of stunts, which I would love to do, I think that would have been more daunting. I would have been like, Phew. I was already a bit nervous about getting the Russian right. So it, it is always daunting. Every single job that you do, you know, regardless of the size of it, whether it's, you know, a small indie play or a small indie film, or it, I always get daunted. There's always something that I'm like, okay, do not fuck up. Don't let anyone else down. But it's that going through in my head. Okay, so uh, a couple of other things I, I, I want to touch on just outside, yeah. uh, John Wick. Uh, obviously, uh, you were involved in Game of Thrones, a cultural phenomenon. Uh, you bowed out, uh, your character bowed out in season six, I believe, at the hands of uh, the, uh, the, yeah. the, the the lovable scamp Ramsay Bolton. Um, oh. did, <laughs> did you, um, was that it for you? Did you watch the rest of the seasons? Yes. You inv- oh, you did? I, yeah, I watched all of it. I was, I was so sad. I, I, I remember that season because I finally I came back after two seasons of being away and they were like, oh, you're going to be working with you. Anne. And I was, I've already worked with him before on something else called Residue. So in the last thing, we were boyfriend and girlfriend and we did like a whole sex scene and everything. And I quite like the fact that the circle of life, he then kills me. Wow. Um, but they were like, yeah, you've only got two weeks. And I was like, oh, with, with him. Right. That means that definitely means I'm dying. Right. Um, I was very sad to go. And the idea I did watch all of them. Obviously, I loved the books as well. I was. I was fully invested in this whole world. Uh, did, you, did you did you enjoy? Because I'm I'm actually a defender of that final season. I, I I mean I know a lot of people weren't happy with it. They felt mm. it was rushed. I think technically there were a few problems. The Battle of Winterfell was was shot too dark. I mean I I'll admit that. But how did you feel about it? So for me, up until um, episode four, I think there was eight episodes. If I'm right. Basically halfway through, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I was like, yes, everything I wanted. I think till about when the 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 Ice King, what's his name? The the yes, you know I, mean? the, yeah, the, I know the King White Walker. The the, the, dies, the 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 big bad from the start of episode one, the first thing you see at the start of episode yes. one, the, a White Walker, and you're like, man, when this guy turns up, all hell's gonna roll. He's dead. Yeah, but that so at that point, it kind of changed for me. Something was missing. I don't know what. Um, maybe oh, it did feel rushed. Maybe that's what it was, or maybe the writing, or maybe I just wasn't happy with the who, who won at the end. I don't know, but for <laughs> me, it didn't work. Like from from the second half onwards, it wasn't for me. But the first half was for me like standard epic Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, finally, um, it, it would be ridiculous because it is, uh, I think, still one of the biggest franchises in the history of cinema. Um, Harry Potter uh, playing yes. Nymphadora Tonks. How much of that was a was that a game changer for for you in terms of your career, and how fondly do you remember that time? Okay, so two questions. Um, um, it was it was a game changer because at that point, um, I'd only I was only doing I was just doing lots of theatre, loads of theatre, mm. and I had done a few little bits and bobs in films, but like tiny parts. So this really was kind of like a, a big step up, um, and I. And then, then actually finishing that, and then coupled with Game of Thrones, that was the that was those two together was the both doors opening a little bit because that after that that's when my agent was like, yeah, why don't you go to LA and try it and like do a pilot season? Because before that, I was itching to go. I had all these friends that were like going there, and I didn't really know what the city was. And I was like, do I need to go? And my agent was like, no, wait, because every every person there is an actor. I mean, literally from Uber drivers to, to wait for <laughs> everyone. So you've got to go there with a bit something behind you. But yeah, it was it, it really, I mean, it massively helped. And it taught me a lot of things about filming. It taught me patience. <laughs> that is a film that I've most had to wait around to do a scene ever. And after that, like nothing can ever touch the size. Now I'm like, no, I'm, I'm good. People now when I do film, I'm like, I'm so sorry with Lem. Like, it's fine. I'm, you know, <laughs> with, with Harry Potter, sometimes I'd come in, I once remember coming in every single day for two weeks and not doing anything. And it was very, you know, you're just like waiting on trailer and then I'm sorry, now it's the end of the day, we haven't got to you. And I'm like, wow. And it would be like that, like, because it's so big, it's that kind of level. And they wanted to get everything so right. And I remember it really fondly. I remember for me, the I had a lot of fun with David Thewlis. That's the person that comes to mind immediately. My husband, he always, you know, he, he, he again gave me a lot of time, but he'd, he'd always be just telling me like stories about, you know, just swapping stories from his life of being an actor and just making me laugh all the time on set. So I, I definitely remember that. And I did, weirdly, I didn't really connect with a lot of the kids because we were in a different kind of, I don't know, it's like they were in their school and I was kind of with the order. 
but because I've done lots of conventions I've got to really meet a bunch of them like recently I did a, a travel show episode with the twins and so I've, I've, I've now built up this kind of lovely group of people in my life that I get to see every once in a while when I do conventions. I, I, and I guess the, the other lovely group of people uh, who I've met um, are, are your band, Molds of Jukebox. Yes. Uh, I, I, am I right in thinking you've got some shows lined up in the UK later this year? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got a couple of them. I mean, it's harder to be a, full, a full-time band now because I suddenly realised in like 2017, 18, that actually I, I found it too hard to do both. I was letting down my band a lot because mm. with music, they book, you know, they've been booking gigs since November whereas with acting I could get an audition next week and I have to go so I felt very and I was like you know what let's do this now more for fun rather than like as a career thing you know touring all the time but yeah we do have a couple of them the one our first one in London is on the 8th of July at Hootenanny in Brixton yeah which is a venue I absolutely love and it used to be such a sweat box and now there's a new manager and he's installed aircon which i'm telling you last year literally saved us years before that I, I, I would literally be sweating out my eyes it was that bad and like like you know like missing notes because my my fingers were just too wet on the accordion so thank you manager of who nanny oh brilliant so it's 8th of july great i do you know what? i'm going to try and come down because it'd be lovely to see yes, you all again i haven't please. seen you lot for so long so long um right then natalia you're about to take us on your perfect night out at the cinema you are our mm. guide we are your audience let's go on a trip to the movies so we push open the cinema four doors and find ourselves in our temple of film in the mm-hmm. foyer, no less. There's an excited buzz as there always is in the cinema foyer, the hum of anticipation. So it's your perfect cinema trip, Natalia. Who have you picked, mm-hmm. living or dead, to go with you? Uh, living or dead? Um, my dog? <laughs> Mimosa? Yeah, I, I get very upset that more dogs aren't allowed in cinemas. Um, and she, and- loves, she loves movies. She loves Bake Off. She loves war films. <laughs> you know, so I take my dog. Yeah, uh, I, or, or my or my fella, or both fella and dog. If I, you know, all together. I I don't want to be strict about this. It's a it's a one guest policy. So is it is it <laughs> going to be is it going to be mimosa? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, you know. Dog. You know that I, I I believe I someone sent me an article saying they do do dog pet screenings now. So there are cinemas where they put on screen like no. they do for babies. No, I've looked it up. I've looked it up. Trust me, I've I've gone down this wormhole because right. part of the reason I don't go to the cinema as often is because there's not one that close to me, and I feel bad leaving my dog that long alone. Mm. Um, but the films that they show, they had one in the Picture House in Piccadilly Circus, but they only show like really weird like children's dog movies. You know, like the, whenever they get like I like, have like, a and I'm like Beverly Hills Chihuahua, for example. I, yeah, I exactly. Exa- yeah, or like. The 101 Dalmatians, a new one. I'm like, yeah, but I want to watch just normal films. With my- <laughs> <laughs> but it is, surely it's for the dog. I mean, you, yes. I mean, like. But she doesn't I, you, like those. She likes violence, you know. She'd love John right. Wick. <laughs> okay, so you, she, you, you, could, you could bang on All Quiet on the Western Front and, and Mimosa yes. would be like. Yeah, right. in, Okay. in. Okay, uh, I, well, I think there's a new avenue to explore here, which is dog screenings, but not dog-based films. I, 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 yeah. I mean, look, why <laughs> it's not? Niche. It's niche, but it could work. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. It's you and Mimosa going to the cinema, so there's a clock on the wall reading a specific time. What time have you gone to the cinema? Um, I really like afternoon slots. Hmm. Like 4 p.m. 4 p.m. There's not that many people, um, especially on a weekday, something like that. Like just like quite empty. So, like that, yeah, that kind of time of day. So the, the the evening, but before it hits cinema rush hour. So you still get a little bit of, a, 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 exactly. you know, a, a, a more intimate experience. Yeah. And then I could, you know, I've got time to go home, like make dinner and stuff. <laughs> That's it. That makes sense. That makes sense. And um, Mimosa, she's walked by then. Does she need a lot of walking? Yeah. No, she's getting old. And actually, like this week, this this week, I've realised uh, we've actually done running now. We can't go running together anymore. Now it's just walks. Yeah, she's twelve, uh, nearly twelve, and I'm like, you know what? You've done. You've done enough. <laughs> oh, that's she's twelve. Wow. I know. I, I, <laughs> this sounds awful. 
on his worst days when he's being an absolute nightmare, I want Simon to be twelve years old and go. I don't. I don't. I don't need two hours on Hampstead Heath. I'm. I'm happy yeah. just. <laughs> I just want to sit around, to be perfectly honest. Maybe watch All Quiet on the Western Front. Again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, so we're going at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, you've booked the tickets for our cinema trip. Where in the auditorium are we going to be sitting? Um. Well, um, uh, well, uh, I've now had to start wearing fucking glasses because I'm now getting old. Um, so, so not so, not too in the front, right? Maybe in the back with my glasses in the middle. Okay, so at the back, glasses, but middle of a row. Yeah, middle okay. of a row. But 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 I oh, actually, this is something else I'd like to create. I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. I'd love to be in the middle, but only if because in my ideal trip, they I think they need to bring back um, intervals. I'm I'm so sick of needing a piss in cinemas. And, you know, having to, like, climb over people and bother people. So I'd either be on an edge if there's – if well, no, this is my ideal night, so there would be an interval. Yeah, so I'd be, there'd be an interval, and I'd be sat in the middle at the back. This is great. You, you preempted my most commonly asked question on this show because I, I sit on an aisle for exactly that reason. I, I, I just can't deal with the stress of going, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and then back yeah. again, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. So I have to sit on an aisle. But you're right. Put an interval in there and yeah. everything's fine. It's a game changer. The thing, is, it, the thing is, it's like 90 minutes. It's fine. But nowadays, films are like, I mean, they're three hours long. 27 like, hours long. Yeah, yeah it's ridiculous. And I want, I, you know, if you want me to, like, eat and drink in your cinema, please give me some time so I don't miss anything. Okay, so I mean, look, this is your perfect cinema trip. So we can either build in an interval, or you mm -hmm. can just have no one else in there apart from you and Mimosa. Oh, well, so and then I can just like piss there. Can... <laughs> <laughs> I meant you could you what, could is leave without. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, you could leave without bothering anyone. You you're just like in in and out. But I guess you'd still miss some of the film, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I see what you do. Do you know what? <laughs> It's it's your perfect night. We're building an interval in, building an Thank interval in. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So the air in the foyer. It's the last thing we'll do before we leave the foyer. It's full of wonderful smells. All manner of snacks and foodstuffs are available. Yeah. What are you choosing to eat? So I, I love popcorn. I, I think you have to be dead inside to not like popcorn. Some form of popcorn. But I, the thing is, in a lot of the cinemas now, you know, they've got the big the big bags of it. I actually think that's too salty. Like I love salt, but I think that's too excessive. So I'd like, you know, those machines where they, it pops like the, you know, like in fairgrounds where it's actually making it for you. One of those massive thing of that salty. And then my ideal drink, and I've, I've studied this at length. I think the best thing that goes with popcorn is if it's non-alcoholic lemonade and if it's alcoholic, lemony double gin and tonic like a strong punchy gin and tonic but basically there's something about the the fizziness and the lightness of lemon kind of cuts through the salt for me and so it's a it's a purely salty popcorn you're not having any sweet in there no mix you're a, a, no, a purist no purist and then like a duck like a large uh gin and tonic a large gin and tonic uh, no, lots spend... of lemon in it, like loads of freshly squeezed lemon in it I, I mean, I, I hear that. Yeah, I mean, that mm. sounds that sounds that sounds delicious. I, I haven't studied it myself, but based on your description, it sounds you know fundamentally yeah, amazing. Beer, like beer, like uh, Coca Cola is t is too sweet. Beer is too filling. Wine is like with the salt. Yeah, this is the perfect one. Trust me. Okay, okay, <laughs> I do. I trust you. I trust you. I don't. I, I'm sure I could find a cinema that sells gin and tonic now. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be there with one of those Gordon's cans from uh, a nearby Offy, yeah, which yeah. You, you, that that is not lemony enough. I'm telling you, that's that's yeah. Well, I'll bring my own lemon, but actually, if it's my ideal night, they would have a bar there and it would be perfect. Of course, what am I saying? We've already got an interval. We can easily construct yeah. a pop up bar. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, with all the other food stuffs available, because you know these days you can pretty much get anything: pizza, nachos, the cinema hot dogs. It, 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 you, not into any of that. No, no. For me, it's a standard popcorn. And maybe, you know, in the interval, in this amazing interval we've got, mm. I'd maybe then, if I finish my popcorn, um, get maybe like some pick and mix. You know, I, I like just the long, 
you know those long licorice things with the, with with the, the white inside of the sherbet, and fizzy on the outside. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'd get like a couple of lengths of them and maybe re up my gin tonic. Okay, a couple of lengths. Uh, do you want to be just because I, I I need to know exact ten. details? Ten. What ten meters or ten? No, no, no. Like... <laughs> ten, ten, ten. Like no, maybe that's too much. Maybe two of the long things and then like a few other bits and bobs, like fizzy cola bottles and just other little bits. You okay. know, like the ones where you get you get overexcited. You're like, I'll have one of everything. Or like the teeth. I quite like the fuzzy teeth. Okay, so pretty much anything. I was going to say, it sounded like you just like the sort of the the uh, the, the sour ones, which I, I personally enjoy. But you're just you you go. You've literally done exactly what you said, which is you've seen the pick and mix in your head now, and you are just taking <laughs> a bit of everything. Everything, <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. Great stuff. All right. It's, it's, it, I love this order. It's a strong order. So ten, no two. You changed it to two snake things. Good. Well, on that note, let's leave the foyer. And walk towards the auditorium down the cinema corridor. I'm going to put up posters along the cinema wall to illustrate some of your most important movie memories. The first poster Ooh. depicts your fondest movie memory. What is it? My fondest movie memory. Um, I mean, uh, that uh, that's tricky because I've got. Um... Okay. I mean, I kind of want to say Jurassic Park, but that's too easy. Um, I maybe I want to say I've got a fond memory for Fifth Element. Okay, um, go because I was I went with my first ever boyfriend. I, I must have been like twelve, and but he had to leave when the Blue Woman started singing, and he he i remember it was like the first time i'd ever kissed someone in the cinema and we kissed loads and loads and loads before he left when the blue <laughs> one was singing so i've definitely got that as a fond memory uh so maybe that one that's, and then me and my yeah, it's, it's like honestly that's the a first date but it's a combination of i'd argue the best scene in the fifth element when the opera singer starts singing and it's like yeah. it's intercut it's just like the way she sings and it's intercut yeah. with the violence on the sort of crew spaceship thing it's yeah. great and then to have an actual emotional moment with someone while that's happening, I get it. Yeah. And then I watched it a lot with a, a really old friend of mine who lives in Australia. And we both, I don't know, we must have been, we, we kept, you know one of those films when you're a teenager and you just watch over and over and over again with your, with your mates? Because, I don't know, that's what kids are like. And we were both meant to go and get the Fifth Element tattoo. And we both got, like, drunk on some tins of something when we were 15 and went to Camden. And we both walked in and I... I I couldn't get it done. She got it, but I was like, go after you. And I, I couldn't do it. And she's like, she still got it on her hip. And we were both meant to get it there. So it's kind of fun because it's like, it was really silly. I did let her down though, but um, I, I, yeah, there's I another mean, added element to it as well. There's a, there's, a, there's a really good piece of advice there that if you are drunk and going to a tattoo parlor, always go second. Always yeah, go always second. Be, always, yeah. <laughs> so that's what it's going to look like. Okay. No, I just imagined something different. I'm not as into that. What... What does a fifth element tattoo look like? Is it just the she? She got the elements. She did like the five elements. Oh, okay. These lines, like, and I was like, and it looked amazing. But as soon as I did it, by then I was like, this is a bad idea. And also, mm -hmm. it wasn't just a bad, bad idea. You know, when you're when you're fifteen, you don't have much money. And yep. I kind of, as I sobered up, I was like, I only have this much money to last me, like I don't know, forever. I was like, <laughs> I actually can't. Do, I don't have enough money to do this. And I was like, babe, don't worry, I'll do it. Like next month, when, when I get paid for my weird hairdressing job, I'll do it. I'll do it. I never did. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's. I, I think. I think. You know, she can pass that off as anything, though. I don't think people are going to see that and go, "Well, that's the fifth element." It's not like she got Bruce Willis's <laughs> massive face. Yeah. <laughs> but at which point you're like, "That's that's mm, weird." Creepy. It's so creepy. <laughs> okay. Making out to the fifth element opera singer scene. I'm putting up a poster for the fifth element. Your second poster that I'm going to put up depicts your worst movie memory. What is that? Oh, Free Willy. 100%. 100% Free Willy. I remember being eight and it, it, whenever it was, it came out. And like we were all, I don't know, it was one of my mate's birthdays and we all had to go to the cinema. And I was like, I was so angry that I was watching this. I don't know why. I was like, this is <laughs> shit. And I, I literally was like, well, I'm just going to have to wait outside. And I was eight. The mum luckily didn't see me and I just sat outside eating my popcorn, reading my Agatha Christie and waiting for everyone. And I was really angry that there's been this trip that I've been looking forward to. And yeah, 
it didn't happen. Uh, so wait, you, you were a shit lo- film. Shit. <laughs> you, you were you were waiting for what? You were waiting for a cinema trip and it didn't happen. What were you? Pl- did you say you were planning on watching something else and then they changed no, the last I, minute? Yeah, I thought we, we were going to cinema to watch something else. I can't remember what. And then she decided, the birthday girl decided it was going to be Free Willy. So we sat down and we're in the dark and it gets to like 10 minutes in. I was like, I'm not watching this shit. And I just <laughs> looked up and read my book outside. And I was really yeah. angry. You know, when you're, when you're little, like cinema trips aren't, you know, they don't happen very often. It has to be mm-hmm. someone's birthday. And I was very angry at her for her choice, basically. <laughs> there are, you can watch the clip on, on, on YouTube where the whale leaps over the seawall. That'll do you. That that's it. That's you it. don't. That's it. You, yeah. You don't need to see anymore. It's one of those movies where you're like, how long do I have to wait to see the bit that was in the, <laughs> the freaking? <laughs> it was in the trailer, so I know it's going to happen. I just, I think it was the movie poster. It's like the whale escapes, so Free Willy does end up free. How long do I need yeah. to wait? Yeah. Exactly. Pointless. Okay. And did did they did they notice you were missing sitting in the foyer reading Agatha Christie? Well, no. When I came out, like the I think the mum or whoever was I think it was mum or dad. They came out. I was like, "What are you doing here?" And I I could see the kind of slight panic in her eyes. It's like, "Shit, I nearly lost a child." But you know, it was fine. It was fun. I was I was well behaved. I, just, I knew what I was doing, and I think it was a cinema near my house. So I was like, "I know the cinema. It's fine. I'll just sit here." Okay. Good. Good. So uh, I'll put up a poster uh, for Free Willy, uh, which again depicts the end of the film. Right. The third <laughs> the third poster that I'm putting up depicts the last performance that brought you to tears. The whale. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I just saw it last week, and I was... I, I, I didn't know what to expect. I tend to not watch trailers or, like, I want to know as little as possible about a film. I mean, it, a little few, I mean, a few elements, maybe an actor that's in it that I like, maybe, oh, it's that kind of genre. Uh, I kind of only see trailers when I go to the cinema. Otherwise, I'm just like, fuck it, let's go see this film. Um, I was not expecting that at all. And actually, it was my friend that called it while we were watching it. She was like, I bet this is a play. This feels like a play. And mm-hmm. it was adapted from a play. Every single person in this film is incredible. Like, the casting is just like, yes, 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 yes. And uh, I think Brenda did deserve that Oscar. Brenda Brazier definitely deserved it. Yeah, it's, yeah, I am, um, I, I, like you, I, 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 like your friend, I was like, this is a this is a play. I knew it was a play going into it. And I've seen some films that, that are very good films, but somehow, like Fences, I, it, I loved I loved it as a film, but it felt like I was watching a play on screen, which, of course, it was. And somehow mm-hmm. his performance in this, uh, you sort of forget that you're watching such a, 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 a static film, which is obviously mainly yeah. set in this one room. Yeah, but it kind of makes sense because of his size. You're mm. kind of in it. You're not. You're not thinking. Oh, they've got one location, budget, or play, or anything. I was just like, no. Obviously, it all has to be set there because you can't leave the house. Mm. Um, yeah, and, amazing. And, and what? Uh, what a story off camera for him as well. So every, everything that happened to him in terms of you know yeah. personal issues, career, and uh, you know to to come back and to come back like this. You just you understood why those tears came on Oscar night. Hmm. Yeah, and you know, because he says this director gave me a creative lifeline, and even I watched his speech and I was like, man, I just, even his speech made me want to cry. Like he's mm. just just great, yeah. Because it must be it must be so strange. It must be such a strange place um, to be in to uh, have been sort of you know this this marquee name, you know, when he was doing mm-hmm. like the likes of the Mummy uh, and and so on, and and then to sort of you know wonder if that's ever going to come back, and for it yeah. to come back in such fashion. Yeah, there's a lot of actors that I've seen recently that that's happened to that you're seeing like you can just drop off for you know a couple of years, maybe a decade, but you never know that your your role is maybe waiting for you ten years down the line. That's gonna yeah. that's gonna be the one. Yes, it's a it's a really positive way of looking at things. I, I do have to ask, c- uh, considering that you didn't watch the trailer for a movie called The Whale and having your fingers so badly burnt with Free Willy, that was a real roll of the <laughs> dice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really right, right. <laughs> it could have been f- mammals. Uh, just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like what? How? How do I make the same mistake twice? It's called the whale free. Like I just, but it's as the it adult version, out. isn't it? Is this the adult version? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, brilliant. Yeah, I uh, fundamentally agree with you. Uh, and, and Hong Chow in that was fantastic as well. She just electrified those scenes that she walked in. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. 
We're on to our final post before we enter the auditorium, and it depicts your unpopular movie opinion. What is it? Well, uh, what, what does that mean, unpopular, in the sense of As everyone perhaps else likes this film? And you hate it, or vice versa. Everyone hates a film that you absolutely love. Oh, God, that's a really hard one. Um, oh, God. Uh, huh. I'm stumped. <laughs> give me some ideas. What's yours? Let me get, give me uh, some... Oh, gosh. What have we had recently? We've had... Uh, oh, okay, uh, recently... Someone, someone, uh, someone defended Love Actually, uh, which I think is widely regarded oh. as 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 a, as a as a slightly outdated and worrying film in some regards. Uh, yes, yeah, I don't know. You're right. <laughs> Although saying that, I do, I do, I do watch it. Like I do, <laughs> I do watch it um, most Christmases. It is up there. Uh, what's okay, the film, everyone. Uh, uh, so yeah, the Christmas. What? You know what? Uh, I mean, again, it's problematic. Um, like you say, but I really love Bridget Jones. Like in that vein, I, I love Bridget Jones. I mean, it's it's it, there's a lot of problems with it, especially as a woman. It's like why does she keep having to lose weight? Why does she do all these things? But I do think it's a good movie. I, it's very enjoyable. Me and my best mate have watched that many many times. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fine. I'm gonna I'll, I'll let you have it be, uh, because I know it's a difficult question. I, I think it, it's on the cusp of being an unpopular opinion. Okay. Because okay, I, um, I think there's still a lot of love for Bridget Jones. I, okay, I, wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't argue that people, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been cancelled just yet. I might be it wrong. <laughs> yeah, maybe in a week it's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could start a campaign now, go, Brid Bridget Jones is over, and by the time this comes out, it'll be like, yeah, well, Natalia uh, called maybe, it. Maybe like something that's like a classic that that everyone... Oh. I know everyone's seen, like I love Vietnam movies. I love them. I love them. I love war in all its glory. Um, I I have literally fallen asleep every single time through um, Apocalypse Now or anything by oh my god Lars von Trier. Fuck me, him. Anything by him I hate, and everyone loves it. I actually went. I, I watched Melancholia, and I actually it's when there were still video stores, and I actually stopped it halfway through. Went to the video store, and I was like. I can't get that hour and a half back. Can I get another movie? And they were like, absolutely not. So maybe Melancholia. Melancholia or Apocalypse Now. And this is like, everyone loves them. I'm like, they are fucking awful. One of those two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, either of those work uh, much better. I'm, I'm going to tear down the Bridget Jones poster for the moment. I might yeah. put it up again when, when that movie is finally called out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, okay. I mean, oh, it's a difficult one. Because melancholia is sort of like this, like oh, you know, I I don't like movies like that, and I've never been as tense for that hour and a half watching that planet uh, head towards Earth. So I think I, I, I'm quite I'm quite the defender of melancholy, which surprises yeah, well, me. A lot of people are because they say it, it does that, but it's for me. I was just like, this is cinematic masturbation. I fucking hate all of it. <laughs> I, I, just to be clear, was there a part of you that when you took that video back and went, I haven't watched it all because I can't yeah. get through it. Can I get another movie? Did you think maybe they'd go, we've seen it. We agree. No, oh, I, I don't know. I just, I just, I didn't even think I was just that angry that something had taken that time away from my life, my limited time on this earth. And I wasn't, even, I was just like, I'll make them understand. And the guy was like, absolutely not go away. <laughs> Stop being so angry. <laughs> I I've never heard of that before. I wonder if that's ever happened. I wonder if anyone's taken a movie back and gone. I I, I want another movie. This isn't this isn't good. This is not. This is bad film. Bad film. Um. So yeah, it's up to you. I mean, Apocalypse Now is more of a classic. Shall I put up Apocalypse Now? Because I can't believe you've never made it through that uh, tremendous film. Yeah, I just think again, it's just dribble. And I know Marlon Brown is amazing, and I know he's a great actor, and he's done lots of stuff. And I see, I can see how, you know, Francis. I can see what they were trying to do, but for me, it's a bit like that. Or, I mean, I can, actually, now I can just keep going with these films. I've just suddenly realised that the scope. <laughs> El Topo, that person was just on acid in the 70s. That's fucking awful. Like, and I think, every, like, all film students really wank on about that one. I'm like, that's also terrible. <laughs> like, what is happening? There's just a guy in a desert with a dwarf on his back. All of it's terrible, terrible. So I think, I think maybe Apocalypse Now. Maybe Apocalypse Now, put that. All right, cool. Do you know what? I, 
I mean, I'm supposed to only put up one, but your argument for both melancholy and apocalypse now, I mean, I, I'm going to make room for both in this final Thank you. Thank you very frame. much. Thank you. All right. We've arrived at the last set of doors. Now, there's a queue of people hoping to join you and Mimosa in the auditorium. Uh, are you allowing them in or are you allowing a few of them in? Do you want a quiet cinema? Do you want a busy cinema? Do you want your classic 4 p.m., like a smattering of people? Yeah, a smattering of people. A smattering of people. Main, not, not, none, like, in, on my row. No, no one on my row, no. like, a first few rows in front of me. Down okay. there, it can, it can be scattered, yeah. Also, it's okay. kind of nice because maybe, you know, if you're completely alone... You know, it, especially if I'm watching something a bit scary, I'm, I can, you know, it can be a bit terrifying. So just having a few people there to know that, you know, there's no psycho killers that are going to come in and kill me, like just as a safety net. OK, great. That's fine. Yeah, because it's uh, I watched Paranormal Activity on my own in a screening room. Oh and I was, it was it was the worst. It was it was like it, I was just terrifying. yeah broken all right so uh, a handful of our audience go wild they're being allowed into the auditorium the others have to have to go home uh, because they'd be sitting too close to you and uh, they, they they'd ruin <laughs> they'd ruin your row so before the movie you've picked for us begins we're going to play a few things first and the first thing we're going to do is play the trailer for the movie you are most looking forward to what is it um so, so i've got kind of two Mm -hmm. June 2, the second the second installment of Dune. I loved I loved it, Dune. I loved it so much. I loved it so, 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 so much. I saw it in the cinema at the Everyman. Um, it's kind of got everything I love, really. That kind of fantasy, sci-fi, violence, a whole other universe that's just wonderful. That. So I can't wait to see what they're going to do with the second bit. Um, and also, my other option is the new Little Mermaid animation. I loved The Little Mermaid growing up. The, the Sebastian song, Under the Sea, is still something that me and my friends, like, <laughs> I, I literally put it on at every house party. I've, I always, like, sneak it in on Spotify list. Um, yeah. So I can't wait to see the live action animation of that and the music of that. And I really hope that that song is in it and they've done a remake of it. You see, I, uh, I, I mean, I, 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 my movie CV is littered with gaps uh, in terms of Disney movies. I, I never watched a lot of them. However, the little, I, I, I've not seen, I've not seen Aladdin. I've not seen Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella. Oh I've not, I've not seen the Lion King. Um, so that is, that is such an error. I think you need to have a Disney day, just a day <laughs> with some popcorn at home and your dog and just watch like all of them. I will say though that Under the Sea was the was the one thing that made me go, oh, maybe these movies are actually something I'd enjoy because that song yeah. is brilliant. Banging. And mm. also Ursula, you know, as I as I'm getting older, I empathise much more with Ursula in just in general, um, and her song is fantastic as well. Okay, I I, I don't know. I got as far as watching Under the Sea once. That's I, my, my, that's <laughs> where my that's where my knowledge ends. Um, but okay, June, yeah, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, I liked it. Do you want to hear my one complaint? And it is a, I feel almost embarrassed, almost embarrassed because it looks incredible. The story is obviously an epic sci-fi tome in the first place. Did you ever watch the David Lynch original um, from way back in the 80s? No, no, I didn't. Okay. So Baron Harkonnen is meant to be this hideous, repulsive, like awful, morally corrupt individual and in the original, he is. And in the book, he is. And I just mm. thought Stellan Skarsgård looked a bit like a Sith Lord, like he'd been parachuted in from a Star Wars movie. I didn't I didn't get I didn't get the Baron Harkonnen I wanted. But I guess if you've not okay. seen them. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I hadn't seen I hadn't seen it. And I've only read half the book. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I don't know why. I just left it one day and it, I just never maybe I lost the book somewhere. But, you had um, Agatha Christie to get to in the foyer. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's more important. Than... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think when you have an image, that's the thing. Like, I hadn't read um, the Harry Potters till I started filming it. So in my head, those people are the way they should look. You know. So for me, I didn't have that that issue. But it is yeah. frustrating. I get that with a lot of. I I collect comics, and when they make comics into films or series, I get irrationally angry because of stuff like this i'm like no that is completely wrong you know i'm out i'm out i'm out i don't buy this anymore wait so did you say you had or hadn't read the harry potter books before you saw the movies no i hadn't so so for me it's like every everyone that looks now i get it now i've read them i'm like oh actually 
you know that person could have looked like that but in my head the way they look is how because i i came to it first through through the mm. movies that's how they should look so i think that's whatever medium you come in first is what sticks with you I, I I get that so much. The only Harry Potter book I read ahead of seeing the movies because I'd see I, I'd watch the first movie and I was like, fine, I'm I'm into this. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. This is great. This is great. Feel good Sunday afternoon viewing. And then I read The Prisoner of Azkaban before I saw the movie, and I spent the entire movie going, that bit's not it. Why have they missed yeah. that, that bit? And, and like it, it's I it's I find it strange that people can read the book and then watch the movie and be completely happy with the movie because surely you're like, but well, that bit's not in it. Well, there's I mean there's some films like um, is it called Enduring Love, the one with Keira Knightley, set in the? Do I mean this? Oh God, it's it, it's one of the, I, I, it sticks in my mind and it's got Benedict Cumberbatch in it as well. It sticks in my mind because it's one of the best ad- adaptations from book into film that I've seen. Oh, like really? that is exactly everything, exactly how I pictured it. And I'd read it relatively recently. So I'm gonna find out what that is actually. Um, I'll text it to you or I'll, I'll send it to you because so you can put it in, but I, I can't remember, enduring something. I don't know. It's kind of set around the war, like just for World War Two. Okay, I mean, look, just uh, just so we can uh, solve this conundrum right now, I will just I will just Google enduring yes. love. Uh, enduring love. Uh, it's enduring love, it's, uh, or, and it's, it's got Kieran. It's said uh, enduring love. It's a two thousand and four British psychological film starring no, that's Daniel Craig and Reese Evans. Let me put in Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch Kira and Kira, Kira. They haven't made that many together. Kira, I will cut all of this out. Kira, <laughs> <laughs> just so we both look like we know what we're talking yeah. about. Kira Knightley film. Okay. Enduring Love is it's written by the same author. That's one thing. It's the same thing. But it's actually called something else. Oh, the Imitation Game. No. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, oh. oh, that's going to bother me so much. Well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll park this for the moment because everything is saying the imitation game and uh, I can't find it. I can't find it. I can't find it, but we'll fix this later. Text it to me and I'll be like, oh, yeah, you yeah, mean yeah. that? Right, fine, fine. Okay, let's move on anyway. We've gone off track yeah, anyway. Go, go. We've gone off piece. Uh, so the next thing we're going to play for you is your favourite shot or sequence from a movie. What is your favourite shot or sequence from a movie? So um, this, okay, so... This, okay. I mean, I, I'm sure there's 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 loads that happen in life that I've, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Especially when it comes to big epic. I, I often think of it in big, you know, fighting war battles because I'm like, how the fuck did they do all this stuff with the horses and the people? But weirdly, the one that comes to mind is something that I was impressed with quite young, and it just stuck with me. Which is in Children of Men. Do, have you seen that film? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like there's there's a bit at the end where there's this continuous shot throughout the whole building and there's a fight and the whole thing's happening. And at the end, she comes out with this baby and everyone stops fighting because they can't be the. I remember watching that and just being. I mean, maybe it was you know the first time as a kind of proper adult with my kind of now an actress head on that I was seeing something like that because I'm sure I've seen far more impressive sequences or similar sequences or whatever. But that is something that immediately, when you asked me that, stuck in my head. That yeah. sequence just blew me. And I was like, how are they doing this? <laughs> I mean, I know Eternal, is it before sunrise and before sunset and all of those? They do a similar thing as well. Mm. And maybe I just didn't notice it as much. I think, you know, those continuous shots, when it's also involving action and dialogue and all of that, that's when I was just like, oh, yeah. this. it's magic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what he did in, I mean, there's that, uh, Alfonso Cuaron, he, he did that shot, and then there's that incredible shot in the car where the camera spirals yes. round. <laughs> yes, the car scene as well. Yeah, so it's a film that you're just like, it's got a lot of those moments in it. Yeah, yeah. All right, then, great stuff. Uh, we're going to play the continuous shot at the end of Children of Men. Okay, so you've very kindly done something for the smattering of audience uh, you've invited in. Uh, you have printed out T-shirts with your favourite movie quote on. What is your favourite movie quote that we're printing on these T-shirts? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I... I, I honestly can't think of anything right now. That's just, I can't even think. 
I've got one of those brains that like I've got very good short term memory. My long term memory is terrible. I think it's part of like how how I'm an actor and that I can learn scripts very, very quickly. Mm. And then they're just gone. Like I can't remember anything of anything I've ever said ever in anything. Um, <laughs> this is not a, a, a question for me. Is, is that just because you are creating space for the next thing or because it's done, it's finished and there's no need to store it any longer? I think it's a bit of both. I just, I've always, that's how I've worked. And I've worked with some older actors, um, especially, you know, kind of, you know, proper thespians who can quote whole bits of Shakespeare. And I'm like, and I've done, I've, I did a Shakespeare on stage and I'm like, I can't remember any of it. I can't remember a single <laughs> word at all. Maybe like the, you know, beware the green eyed monster because, you know, everyone knows that phrase. And there's a few Shakespearean phrases I know, but I can't remember. I can't, that's really bad, isn't it? So, 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 so potentially. Sorry. Someone oh, could. You know so, I know. I know. I know what it, I'm. I know what I'm gonna pick because I live on a canal boat. We need to get a bigger boat. <laughs> yeah, that one. That'll do. Because <laughs> I. <I'm... laughs> oh, see, I love it. You just looked around and were like, "Boat, we're gonna." Need... That's a quote. Yeah, fan... I. I love. And are you not? I mean, I, I. I don't know that I could live on a canal boat purely because of. Uh, an irrational fear that I have of sharks, and I, 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 I'm assuming your your canal boat is parked in UK water. Parked? What? I, yeah. I, I, what's it called? Moored. Moored in UK water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but Am do, I also, do you? Oh wait, wait! I've just had, thought of another one that makes me laugh. I basically coming to America is the film I watch every Christmas. Every Christmas, mm. for some reason, that for me is a prop. That means Christmas. That it's a wonderful life and trading places and Elf. Um, no, not Elf. Um, Scrooged as well. Oh, Those yes. are kind of my Christmas classics. Um, I actually last year, there's a new one that I've now added to my roster, which is Bad Bad Santa, um, oh, oh, which yeah. made me laugh so much. I saw it like last year for the first time. Um, I really like the quote, the royal penis is clean. That makes me laugh every single time when I come to America. <laughs> I just think it's so <laughs> random. It's so unexpected. So it's that and we need to get a bigger boat. What You know, one or the other, whichever. Depends how old what? you are. Do you want to put one on the front and one on the back? I mean, it's... Yeah, well, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, that's Sure. Done. We'll, we'll put... You're going to need a bigger boat on the front and just hope that not too many parents turn around and go, wonder what's yes. on the back of those T-shirts? Uh, the royal penis is clean. That's uh, that's fascinating that you just... You literally learn a script, know it off by heart, and then pff, it's gone. I mean, could, could, yeah. could potentially someone come up to you and go, oh, my God, I love that line from Harry Potter. And you'd be like, who said that? And they're like, yeah, you did. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, because like, I get I get asked a lot by some fans, like, what's your favorite quote from the movies in general? And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. I know the word Voldemort. I don't know. <laughs> like, Beware Voldemort. Is that line? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I probably just always go with which is it seemed to be how Harry Potter met every adult character. The same line was used, which was. Harry Potter, eh? And that was that's that's what that, that, that was that that would be my go-to. All right, so we are going to put on. Yeah, we're going to need a bigger boat, and the royal penis is clean. Okay, we're getting close to the finish line now. Yeah. Uh, just before we uh, announce the movie you've picked tonight, we're going to play your favorite score or song from a film. What is it? Okay, so. I, I, I'm sorry, I keep giving you two things because I always have two versions. I, like I said, I, li I like Vietnam stuff and war films especially. Platoon soundtrack for me growing up was one of my most favourite soundtracks in the world. I absolutely loved it. Um, uh, in my adolescence, I just... I remember I kept... And people, all my mates loved it as well. And they, I'd always had my CDs and they would scratch it. And it was like... I think it's one of my most bought CDs because I loved it so much. And when someone scratched, I was like, <laughs> so I've got that one. I think um, as a as a full soundtrack again, it's either that or Dirty Dancing. I think Dirty Dancing again was a very seminal um, kind of film for me growing up, uh, and I, I think every single song on that is a banger. That's uh that's amazing. That well, it's just a it's just a lovely uh, a lovely double bill of soundtracks. What should we listen to, guys? It's either Platoon or <laughs> Dirty Dancing. What, what yeah, do you, see how you're what feeling? Do you what, what, yeah, how are you feeling? Yeah. Like that, you know? 
you've got something for every mood there. That's great. So, yeah. uh, so you really loved war movies as a kid, and specifically Vietnam movies. Yeah, I think so. My dad, when he was going through a divorce, I live with him mainly, and he was in the special forces in Spain. Um, because we had like a military dictatorship and that kind of followed on when, when my dad was growing up and they had to do a military service. Uh-huh. But my dad, you know, most kids hated it, you know, especially in the seventies, at that point, people were just like, I'm going to do the bare minimum year, smoke loads of weed and just get through this year. It was my dad was like, Oh, this is an opportunity. I'm just going to be in the special forces. So my, my dad's way of kind of dealing with a divorce, thank God he didn't drink. Um, he's not a drinker at all. Um, was to watch like to roll cigarettes and watch, war films and he had kind of had insomnia poor dad it was it was a hard time in his life but I was with him and I just I try and stay up with him um you know watching these films I now realize probably shouldn't have watched that age but um <laughs> I loved I loved Predator I loved Platoon I loved um I mean just all, all of them all of that that's why for me Apocalypse Now we were saying earlier that I hated that's when it, it, I find it very hard to kind of you know n- not like it mm. um so that, that I think for me it's got a special place in my heart because of that, but also I love I love World War One films more than World War Two in many cases. Actually, I just I'm fascinated by World War One. I. I listen to Do you know Dan Carling? I don't. He's a this guy. This podcast. You're welcome, by the way. It's amazing. Thank it's you. Hours of history, and he's got 16 hours on World War One called Blueprint for Armageddon, which I've listened to maybe four times. I listen to it when I can't sleep, and I'm just like, ah, oh, the voice of Dan Carling in war. <laughs> um, so yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I've got. I don't know why I'm fascinated by it. Okay, okay. Um, have you have you watched All Quiet on the Western Front yet? The uh, yes, the, I'm, mm. yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's fantastic. I watched it as soon as it came out, and actually, I think now it's due for a rerun again because I, again, when I when I see these epic movies, I feel like the first time it's just like, and then mm. a few months later, I'm like, can I watch it again to actually take it in properly? 1917 again, incredible. Yeah, uh, and I read All Quiet on the Western Front when I was very young, and I loved it because it was. It was the only thing that I kind of had to hand as a reference of the German point of view. Because, you know, mm. we always see, the, you know, the English side, blah, 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 you know, growing up, you know, being educated in England. Whereas this was a book that I was like, wow, it was the same thing was happening to them as well. Yeah, I, I haven't read the book. I watched the film. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible piece of cinema. The soundtrack, the ominous dong. Yeah. It's just terrifying. Uh, mm. But what they do to us. In that final shot, I just couldn't believe. I was yeah. like, "Oh, are you, jo- my are you joking? Yeah. God, you've got to be kidding me! That's that's it's almost too much." But then the reason I'm talking about it is because it's so effective. All right, then we're going to play uh, a double bill of the score from "Dirty Dancing" and "Platoon." Ah, mm-hmm. right, it's time to announce. The film, out of all other films you have picked to play to this smattering of people in this room and Mimosa, your dog, <laughs> what film have you picked and why? Uh, okay, this is another one that's pretty... Oh, fuck, I've, I've again got two. Can I have a double bill? <laughs> I mean, you've had two for pretty much everything, so why, why not? Yeah. why not... Why not stay? Why not stay in the habit? Let's carry on. Yeah, okay. you can have a double bill. Okay, I'd start with Silence of the Lambs. Okay. And I'd follow it with Strictly Ballroom. Another. Just, Dirty Dancing and Platoon and now Silence of the Lambs and Strictly Ballroom. Okay, yeah. uh, which are we playing first? I think, the, I think let's end on a dance, you know, like I want to leave dancing. You know, okay. I don't want to leave like thinking shit, you know. Uh, there's uh, a skinny skin 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 monster out there. <laughs> Just kill me. In my, in my <laughs> yeah. She so rubs the lotion that. on her skin. On she skin. rubs the lotion <laughs> on her skin. Oh, yeah. that's another great quote. <laughs> <laughs> you're not having. Skin. You're not having three. You've that we've printed the t-shirts. They're already made. Um. Yeah. So I start with Silence of the Lambs. I think that's. I I just think about actually how little time Anthony Hopkins is in that movie. I, I think it's not that long. I mean, when I actually think about it, because I've seen it quite a few times, it's not that much, but his presence is just incredible. And that kind of, that character he's made is just, did he win an Oscar for that? I don't know. Did he? He did. Yeah, he oh, yeah, did. Yeah. 
It's one did. of the it's one of the films for here. Here's some Oscars trivia. Uh, it's one of the films that won the Big Five: uh, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, Actress. Really? Yeah, I, I can't remember that. Yeah, but the the Big Five. It's like the last film to actually uh, do that, I believe. But how old were you when you saw it? Was it? it was it? Uh, I was uh, young. I I must have been like ten or eleven or 12, something like that. Uh, someone's sleepover, and it's like let's watch this. You know, when you're little. Um, so yeah, I think that 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 would be a good start, and then. Strictly Borum, again, it's one of those ones with the same Australian friend, actually, who, with the Fifth Element tattoo, mm. me and her watched Strictly Borum again on repeat. And I love it because, you know, I'm Spanish as well. And I was like, I think at that age as well, I was a bit like Fran. You know, I had lice. I was chubby. No one wanted to have sex with me. And I was just like hoping that I would like transform like her into this kind of Spanish dancing queen you know, out of the other end of puberty. So it kind of gave me that kind of hope that everything was going to be okay eventually. Uh, I, so are you, a, is, is that a unique Baz Luhrmann film that you love or are you a fan of him in general? No, love it. I, I recently saw the Elvis um, on a plane on the way back from work, from doing this episode, actually this travel show with, with the twins in, in, in Turkey in January. And on the way back, I watched it and I loved it so much that when I got home, I was like, to my fellow, I was like, we need to watch it again right now. You need to watch this film now. So the next day we watched it again. I just think he's great. I love, I love the colour and the music that he brings to everything he does. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a fantastic film. I, I think Austin Butler is uh, tremendous as Elvis. And I think mm -hmm. a part of that for me is the fact that I, I, I didn't know him really. I know he was in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in a, a smaller role, but I didn't know him as an actor. So no, it's, me much, neither. it's much easier, don't you think, to, to watch someone who is uh, relatively unknown uh, and accept yeah. them inhabiting such an iconic figure? Yeah, because you've got no preconceived anything of them. I mean, mm. you know, it's, and that's now, now, I mean, well, where does he go now from this? You know, he, now he's Elvis. So let's see where he goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, had, I, had a, I had read a weird quote that he said his voice might never go back to normal and he's ever, forever going to sound <gasps> like Elvis now. Well, you know, it, interestingly, I, so I, I did this that because I, that I've got a similar story about that because I did um, a series called Origin for YouTube, which unfortunately is one of my, one of my most favourite jobs I've ever done. And I was I, actually I did it with Tom Felton. So I really bonded with him. I had a great time with that, like working with him again. And it was in South Africa. It was great. And because it was a series and they were writing it as they went, um, my character was American. And I've when I when I when I get American, when I you know when I have to be an American, you know, you, if it's a film or a, a set piece, you can just learn that script, you know, by heart. Whereas with the, with a the series, they're writing it, and I was like, I can't fuck up this American accent. So for six months in in Cape Town. When I got there, I only spoke an American accent to everyone, to my friends, to, like to everyone. Because I had friends that came and visited me. I just stayed in this accent <laughs> to try, because I was so concerned that I was going to be terrible. And then I remember the last day of shooting and they were like, oh, no, Nat, that's it. You're actually done. I mean, you're filming today, but you're done for words. And <laughs> I was like, yes, I can go back to normal. And I, I rang my fella and I tried to speak in my normal accent and he he literally just laughed for literally a minute and hung up the phone because he could it was like all right God. it was a bit like chitty chitty bang bang I don't I was stuck and I was like okay so that's my that's my that's my life now it was, ter it was I was genuinely terrified and actually a few days after luckily it was a rap party I had a few drinks and then suddenly my tongue relaxed and I was like oh I'm back but for like two days I was genuinely concerned that I was oh, like, oh, one broke I've, bro I've broken it so wait, so wait, so so when you spoke to uh, your 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 fella, he it wasn't that you were still in the American accent. You were trying to do an English accent, and you sounded well, just, like Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, I, yeah. I just my I, my tongue had forgotten what to do, so I was like, <laughs> I I'm back now. And he was like, What are you doing? And he was like, No, I, I'm speaking like I no no. And he was like, so, He just laughed, and he couldn't he couldn't actually. <laughs> He couldn't even deal with it. He had to just hang up and start speaking later. So it can happen. But yeah, that's the only ever that's the only time I've ever kind of consistently kept an accent um for a job. <laughs> right. Well, we've played the Silence of the Lambs, followed by Strictly Ballroom. And that's it, Natalia. The curtains have closed. The guests are milling out, smiling, oh. chatting, and take thanking you for taking them on an incredible night out at the movies and also well done i didn't even realize you picked a double bill and built in an interval so that really that really worked work. 
It does. It does. It does. Uh, but before you go, it's time for this week's mystery question. As we ask, what's in the box? So I have a box. Uh, it has a Ooh. mystery question in it. Okay. Okay, as someone who has appeared in some of cinema's biggest franchises, would you ever consider joining the cast of a superhero movie, either in yes. the Marvel or DC? Yes. Oh, okay. yes. A hundred percent. I would literally love that. That would make me. That would help me to die a happy woman. Um, I just. I mean, like I said, I love comic books and yep. anything in that universe. I'd love. Um, I kind of thing is, I'm not so. For me, some of the Marvel stuff is very trad. I, the kind of comic books I like are a bit more like I love Transmetropolitan. I loved Preacher before, you know, when it, you know, now everyone knows it, but Preacher, The Boys, Walking Dead. So I've always had that kind of a, maybe you'd say a kind of more darker, well, no, I suppose some of the trad stuff is also quite dark, but I've, I've never really invested time in, in those ones. But anything like that, I'm in, I'm in 100%. So do you have a wish list? Is there a character who you're like, please don't let them make that without at least asking me? Uh, to audition oh, for I've a had, talk oh I've had so many I, you know what before they made Preacher <clears throat> I remember when, when I read it and I was 21 and I rang my agent I was like please please can I go up for Tulip maybe one day <laughs> I will you know go up for that um, I would love to be in, in trans, if they ever made a film of Transmetropolitan I would love to be um, one of the filthy assistants which makes sense if you've if you read it mm-hmm. um, or, be, or be Spider Jerusalem if they made it to a woman that would be great. <laughs> okay, that's great. I'm, I'm glad that was the mystery question. I, I wasn't yeah. sure when you said, I'm so passionate about comic books when I see them done badly on screen, it makes me angry, but actually done right. You're up for that. Yeah, yeah, completely. Natalia, that is it. Your taxi <laughs> has arrived to ferry you back to reality. I have a lot of notes this week because you picked more than one answer for so many questions, I'm so but sorry. I'm just... it's fine. Let's recap your perfect night out of the cinema. You are taking your 12-year-old dog, Mimosa, at 4 p.m. You are sitting with Mimosa in the middle with absolutely no one around you and building in an interval to tonight's double bill. You are having salty popcorn with some very lemony gin and tonic. You are then having a bit of pick and mix, two of those sherbet-filled snakes i'm gonna call them uh some fizzy cola bottles and then we're gonna bosh in some teeth there as well your fondest movie memory is kissing to the fifth element aged 12 when the opera singer is performing your worst movie memory is having to leave free willy to read agatha christie in the foyer because it's so in your words shit the last (laughs) performance that brought you to tears was watching Brendan Fraser in The Whale and your unpopular movie opinion. It's a combination of Apocalypse Now and Melancholia are impossible to get through. The movie you're most looking forward to is June Part 2 and The Little Mermaid. Your favourite shot in a movie is the end of The Children of Men. Uh, The quote, well, we've got two. (laughs) We're going to need a bigger boat on the front end. The royal penis is clean. On the back, we're playing the double bill of Dirty Dancing and Platoon as the score. And finally, we're watching Silence of the Lambs, followed by Strictly Ballroom. Natalia, thank you for taking us on a trip oh. to the movies. Have you had a good time? I've had a great time. Uh, would, you, would, you, would you like my movie day? Is this something you, you're into? I, I love it. I, there's a there's a lot of fun to be had in, in that experience. I think it's very exciting. I, I love the combination of Science of the Lambs and Strictly Ballroom. <laughs> uh, I'm into that. And, you know, if you're taking Mimosa, I'd bring Simon and, uh, you oh, know. Oh, they love each other. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. Yes, you